Brothers and sisters, I believe that behind every mistaken understanding of reality, there is always a mistaken understanding of God. It might sound like a true, too broad a generalization, but I, I find it to be true. Most people don't read at that theological level, but uh, if you probe someone who is in a violent or, or fearful uh, state inside of their life or their world, you draw close, you talk to them, and you always find their God is inadequate. Huh? Their God is distorted, or their God is even toxic. And that's why after all is said and done, good theology uh, is still so important. And I guess I'd like to believe, and I was so happy at the excitement expressed by so many of you last week, I would like to believe that this is the ultimate theology, <laughs> the clarification of the central, foundational, pivotal, eternal doctrine of the Trinity. We would have to believe that this is somehow the template of all reality, the pattern of reality, that who God is, if I can even call it the shape of God, is somehow has to be the shape of the world and the shape of reality. And it's amazing, 2,000 years after the Christian revelation, that still this doctrine of the Trinity has been so little reflected on. Uh, it's, it was always told us, if you got an education like I did, that it was a mystery. Don't think about it. And of course, now we know that what mystery means is not something that is not understandable. It is something that is infinitely understandable. And therefore, you can never get a total grasp on it. You just keep coming at it from a thousand sides. Now that's, of course, as you know from last week, what I'm doing here. I'm going to begin tonight by reading for you a, a section of John 17. And while I'm reading it, I just want you to ask, now again, we've heard these, those of you who've grown up Christian, we've heard these kind of lines all of our life. So they don't shock us anymore, but they should. And I want to remind you, this is written maybe 60, 70 years after the death of Jesus, approximately the year 90 or even as late as 100. Jesus has been gone for that long, and they've been reflecting on this experience of who he was, what he brought them into. And they talk in a way that is frankly scandalous and heretical to the Jewish mind. It's no wonder most Jewish people could not deal with this new Christ. I mean, this, I remind you, was the great monotheistic religion. There is one God, and they fought for that, and their, their prophets insisted on it, and any relativizing of that or softening of that was pure heresy. So good, orthodox, upstanding Jews could not hear this talk that John is using here. So just hear it with a possible shock. Jesus says, Do now, Father, give me glory at your side, a glory that I had with you before the world began. I have made your name known to those you gave me in the world. These you gave me were already yours. Now they realize that all you gave me comes from you, as we talked about last week. I entrusted to them the message that you entrusted to me, what I called the pattern of reality. Jesus is the bringing of the eternal pattern into the created world. When he talks about his word or his message or his truth, just think of it in that way. And they received it. They have known that in truth I came from you. They have believed that it was you who sent me. So already we have a split here. Huh? They've come to believe in the divinity of this person, Jesus, and yet he is clearly praying to another one as the divine. I pray for them that they all may be one. As you, Father, are one in me, and I am one in you. 
I pray that they may be one in us. So that centripetal force that I talked about last week, that, that, that circular life in God has now become a, become a centrifugal force, moving outward and in its sweep, pulling in all of creation and even us. I pray that they may be one in us and that the world may believe that it was you who sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. This is extraordinary. <laughs> We're talking about you sharing in the glory that has come from God. Now, we let the, those kinds of words uh, slip off our tongues as if we understand them. This is scary stuff. <laughs> I pray that they may be one as we are one, I living in them and you living in me, that their unity may be complete so that the world will know that you sent me. So as this glory moves outwards and others can participate in this paradox of diversity and communion. Now remember, that's the ultimate paradox of Trinity. Ultimate autonomy of three persons as we call them, who are nevertheless in perfect communion. Now that is the template of everything. You've got to hold together what seems impossible to hold together. Diversity with union. And that's the only way we'll ever survive in this world. Father, all those you gave me, I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of ours, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. Now this would be referring to what we call in theology the pre-existent Christ, the Logos, the eternally begotten Son, right? the eternal Son of the Father. And we're going to have to start there tonight, and then we move out from that point. Just Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And this is the authority of Jesus. He never doubts. Huh? who he knows and who he is in union with and who he speaks for. And these have known that you sent me. To them I have revealed your name and I will continue to reveal it. So Jesus becomes the great mediator, the great broker of the mystery who enters in in believable, visible form because we needed an image, we needed an icon to understand what the heart of God was like. We couldn't get it all in, in mere metaphysical or abstract language. Frankly, we needed to see a human gaze and to trust that's what the gaze of God was like. To them I have revealed your name so that your love for me may live in them. You see the passing on. And I may live in them. One of the very few passages, there aren't actually a lot, it surprises people, that are found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is this one. Anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. You've all heard that. You've grown up as Christian. But do you see what's happened here? This is an amazing chain of being from the one being that we would call God and it has moved into our world and is including us. And that's why Jesus can say in other places these amazing things like how you treat one another is how you treat God and how you love God. This is an amazing identification and, and suddenly reshapes uh, who God is and where God is. It's a spatial change. Somehow God is no longer out there, which religion from the beginning of time has somehow seen. But again, I want you to ask, what kind of utterly new experience of God has happened on this earth that John or John's community can write these kinds of words that we just heard? What would give him such courage to describe God in this strange new way? Now he's going to go on, or just has in the previous chapter also, describe this giving of the Spirit, which we'll get into in the future. 